In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Moment of silence. Let us feel God's presence around us. His presence in our lives. His presence in this gathering. And ask him to give us his spirit to take control of our minds and hearts, to enlighten us, to help us see what we need to see, to hear what we need to hear, and to transform us. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A lady help of Christians, pray for us. Angels and saints of God, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning and good evening, beloved brethren. Depending on where you are right now, I say welcome to our online Bible study. The topic for today's Bible study is Introduction to the Eucharistic Prayer at Mass. Introduction to the Eucharistic Prayer at Mass. The Eucharistic Prayer is the center and summit of the whole Mass. Put differently, with the Eucharistic Prayer, we come to the most important part of the Mass and enter into the heart of the entire celebration. Under this particular component of the liturgy of the Eucharist, we shall be discussing a number of things, such as the preface, the sanctus, the epiclesis, and so on. But today, we shall begin with a general introduction to the Eucharistic prayer. As usual, my references in this discussion will be the Catechism of the Catholic Church, General Instruction of the Roman Missal, Understanding the Mass by Charles Belmont, the Mass by Reverend Guy Auri, the Mass by Cardinal Donald Wall and Mike Aquilina, the Mass by Edward Street, the Catholic Mass revealed by Thy Kingdom Come, How Not to Say the Mass by Dennis Mulaski. The Liturgy, the Work of the Holy Spirit by Abbot Jeremy Driscoll, and Understanding the Order of Mass in the Light of Vatican II by Brother Pius Adjimang. Now, let us proceed with our study. As we said in our introduction to the Mass, the Mass is divided into two parts. The first part is the Liturgy of the Word, and the second is the Liturgy of the Eucharist. The Eucharistic prayer is the second component of the liturgy of the Eucharist. The first component being the presentation and preparation of gifts, which we concluded last week. The Eucharistic prayer is the center and summit of the entire mass and the climax of all the other parts of the mass. According to Reverend Guy Auri, the Eucharistic prayer is the heart of the Mass, the center towards which everything converges, the source from which everything flows. Failing it, there is not and cannot be Mass. The sacrament is not celebrated. The Eucharistic presence of Christ is not brought about. The memorial of his sacrifice is not made real. 
without the Eucharistic prayer. The Eucharistic prayer is also called canon. It begins with a short dialogue between the priest and the faithful, which precedes the preface and ends with the doxology, which precedes the Lord's prayer. It is addressed to the Father, although the prayer is equally Christocentric, considering the several references to the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ. In other words, the prayer lays emphasis on Christ's redemptive action or act, as the case may be. During the prayer, the priest speaks in the first person plural, we. What this indicates is that he is not speaking for himself alone, but on behalf of the church, that is the entire assembly as their head. Referencing the general instruction of the Roman Missal, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops maintains that in the Eucharistic prayer, the priest unites the congregation with himself in the prayer he addresses in the name of the entire community to God the Father through Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Through the Eucharistic prayer, the entire congregation of the faithful with one voice, literally the voice of the priest, joins itself with Christ in confessing the great deeds of God and in offering the sacrifice. In the past, the celebrant at mass was allowed to compose the Eucharistic prayer for the celebration. That is in the early history of the church, it was so. But later a fixed formula was given. At this time in the Roman church, there was only one recognized Eucharistic prayer called the Roman canon. That is the order of celebrating mass. It was written in the fourth century and it was written in Latin. But after the Second Vatican Council, eight other Eucharistic prayers were introduced and are currently in use. To be more precise, Pope St. Paul VI later published a revised standard, sorry, a revised Roman Missal and added three others, which we now know today as Eucharistic prayers two, three, and four. However, the latest edition of the Roman Missal in English, also known as the Sacramentary, has nine Eucharistic prayers. Following Edward Street's list, there are the traditional Roman canon Eucharistic prayer one, the three new ones added by Pope Paul VI, Eucharistic prayers two, three, and four. The three prayers for children's mass and the two prayers for reconciliation composed for the Holy Year in 1975. What really happens during the Eucharistic prayer? The Eucharist from the Greek Eucharistian means thanksgiving. But now what really happens at this point at mass. According to Charles Belmont, what is really taking place during the Eucharistic prayer is that the priest leads the entire congregation in offering to God the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and gives thanks for God's goodness and glory. I repeat, what happens during the Eucharistic prayer according to Belmont is that the priest leads the entire congregation in offering to God the redeeming sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and gives thanks to God our Father for his goodness and glory. At this point, I invite our reader to please read two passages from the scripture for us. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25 and Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 29. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 25 
For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Matthew 26, 26 to 29. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In those passages, we can see what Jesus did while instituting the uh, Eucharist. He gave thanks, then he broke it and said, take it. At the end of it all said, do this in remembrance of me. So as I said, quoting Belmont, during the Eucharistic prayer, the priest leads the entire congregation in offering to God the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and gives thanks for God's goodness and glory. Now, what is the history of the Eucharistic prayer at Mass? Edward three traces it to the table prayers that the Jews recited at every meal. He explains that before the meal, the father of the family or the one who presided over the community will take the bread and say the blessing called Baraka to praise God. After that, they will break the bread and give to those at table who will then partake of the different courses or the different things that are set on the table. As Edward Street informs us, the reading of the Haggadah was an essential part of the Jewish Passover meal. The people listened to this reading, which repeated the story of the first Passover in Egypt and interpreted and emphasized its significance for the present generation of Jews. The whole point of the reading was to make the seven deeds of God in the past that is, in the time of their ancestors in Egypt, present to those of them who are here now. This was to enable them to internalize the fact that what God did, he did not just for their fathers who were present in Egypt at the time of the first Passover, but for, the, for them as a people. In other words, they were meant to personalize or apply that experience to their own lives because God did it for them too, even though they were not present or born at that time. Furthermore, it was three. As they near the end of the meal, the one who presided prayed a second baraka or blessing over the cup of wine. This blessing had three parts. The first part was in praise of God for his creation. The second was the thanksgiving for the work of redemption he wrought for his people in the past, the giving of the covenant, the laws, and so on. And the last part is a supplication for the future that God will continue saving works in the lives of his people. From every indication, as three observes, 
The early Eucharistic prayers at Mass in the early days of Christianity and the Eucharistic prayers of our Mass today seem to have followed this pattern. They include the blessing over the bread and wine, the narrative of the seven events of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the threefold structure of all offering praise to God for creation, thanksgiving for his deeds and supplication. So you can see the similarity between our Eucharistic prayers today and what the Jews used to do each time they gathered for their meal. The elements or parts of the Eucharistic prayer are the preface, the sanctus of holy, 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 the epiclesis, the words of institution of consecration, the mystery of faith, the anamnesis, offering, intercessions, and doxology. In these different elements of the Eucharistic prayer, we do a number of things, such as praise and thanksgiving, acclamation, invocation of the Holy Spirit, and more. For example, we express our thanksgiving most especially in the preface. As Belmont observes, here on behalf of the entire congregation, the priest praises God and thanks him for the whole work of salvation or for some special aspects of it that correspond to the feast of the day or the season of the year. The thanksgiving in the preface is followed by an acclamation. The the priest and the entire congregation join the angels and the saints in heaven in singing the sanctus of the holy, holy, holy. After the sanctus, we move to the epiclesis, which means invocation. Here the church invokes the Holy Spirit and implores his power that the gifts we have offered may be consecrated and transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ and that they should become the source of salvation for all who partake of them. Now, what should be our attitude to the Eucharistic prayer at Mass? According to the general instruction of the Roman Missal number 78, the Eucharistic prayer demands that all of us listen to it with reverence and in silence. I repeat. The Eucharistic prayer demands that all of us listen to it with reverence and in silence. As Brother Adiman observes, one thing we must note about the Eucharistic prayer is that this period for the Eucharistic prayer is not a time for private prayer. It's not a case that a priest is leading the Eucharistic prayer, then I am saying my own private prayer no matter what that prayer is about. Rather, it is a time for closest communion of prayer in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All of us unite in saying that prayer, even though the priest says it on our behalf, in unity, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Both the priest and the entire congregation join themselves as one to Christ and acknowledge the great things that God our Father has done, especially in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ for salvation, the same sacrifice that we are reenacting at Mass. Today, we have had a general introduction to the Eucharistic prayer, and we have touched a little on the, of the Eucharistic prayer. From next week, we shall start discussing them in greater details, beginning with the preface. With that, I conclude the discussion for today and pray that God will bless his word in our hearts through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us lift our minds and hearts up to God and appreciate him 
for the gift of life, for the gift of Jesus to us, for the gift of the mass, for the gift of one another. For this single opportunity he has given us to gather every Tuesday from our different locations. Let us thank this God who does not give up on us. Thank him for the different blessings he has bestowed on you and your family. Thank him for those unknown blessings, things that you're not even conscious of that he has saved you from. There are many battles we fight in life. And because you can see that he's delivering us, we say thank you. But there are many battles he has fought for us that we're not even conscious of. And that is why we are still standing. Thank him for everything. We have got up for this Bible study and he has said something to us. He has said something to us in the area of rating our participation, our level of involvement, our level of presence. He is present there 100%, but what is the level of our own presence at mass? 100% he tries to engage us, but are we really there? How do we rate ourselves at the level of, maybe from the standpoint of encounter, do I really get to meet God or encounter him? At the level of hearing, do I hear the many things God says to me at once? Do I hear him clearly in his word? Do I hear him in the homily? Even when I do, do I often make a response? Do I leave the mass with a given response that, our Lord, I have heard you and I've responded to what you said to me? What do I do with what he has said to me? After mass, do I just rush off or I spend a few minutes to say thank you and to rate my participation with the intention to improve on what I'm doing. Am I allowing the mass to transform me little by little? Can I feel any transformation taking place in my life on account of my regular attendance or participation at mass? A story says God sent an angel and a young boy to go and count the number of people at mass. The boy came back and said 3,005. And the angel said about 400 or 450 people. If God were to send an angel to count, not just to count the physical people there, but to count people on the basis of the fact that they are truly participating at mass, will I be among the 400 or 450 people that will be counted? Why am I there physically, but not there mentally and spiritually? What needs to change? Do I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit around me during mass? Do I get to meet Christ at mass? During Mass, do I ever step into Calvary? Do I ever get to Calvary imaginatively at Mass and spiritually? If I do, what happens at Calvary? When Jesus comes down at Mass, do I feel him? him do I, imaginatively and spiritually, do I feel him that yes, he has come and that do I engage him? What needs to change in the way I participate at mass? 
And who do I need to reach for God? God earnestly desires to reach many people in your family. He desires to reach some of your children. He desires to reach some of your grandchildren. He desires to reach some of your friends. How many people are you bringing to him? On that last day, should God ask us, how many people, I used to hear you sing at mass, I will not go empty handed. And he says, so who have you did bring to me during your lifetime on earth? What will I respond? Have I made enough effort to invite people to programs and even to this Bible study? Have I persuaded people enough to participate? Do I care enough about what they know or what they do not know? Do I care enough about getting more Catholics to understand the mass? Do I care enough about people's salvation? Who do I need to reach for God before next Tuesday? Who will I show God next Tuesday as somebody I have labored with his grace to bring to him? May the good Lord put that desire for our own salvation and the salvation of others into our hearts in a very deep way through Christ our Lord. Amen. We shall pray using Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5 and 9 and 10. Listen to the word of God as I read to you. A word of Yahweh came to me. Even before I formed you in the womb, I have known you. Even before you were born, I had set you apart and appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then Yahweh stretched out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I give you authority over nations and over kingdoms to uproot and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. So, before I formed you in the womb, I have known you, even before you were born, I had set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That was for Jeremiah. Before he was created, God gave him a purpose. Before any of us was created and came into this world, God gave each of us a purpose. What is that purpose? What is that specific mission God has given you. What we have in Isaiah 1, 1 to 10 is what Isaiah made up of, made, made out of his own purpose. He knew the purpose, he knew his mission. This was like his own job description for God. What is your own job description for God and his kingdom? And are you following it? What is your job description for God? He created us to know him, to love him, to serve him. In what specific way is he calling you to serve him? Serving God is not just what you do in a general way. They say this, I do. They say that, no, that is good. But what specific area has God assigned to you as a person? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you as you begin to engage God in this area. It must be something that you know clearly. Yahweh says in verse 10, see today I give you authority over the nations and over kingdoms to uproot and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Now I will want you to stand on that authority, your authority as a Christian, your authority as a child of God, and begin to pull down things in your life 
things in your life that shouldn't be in your life. Every obstacle to your spiritual growth. Anything in your life that has not been planted by the Father. The word of God says, whatever the Father has not planted shall be uprooted. And we are told that we have the power to approach. Anything enemies may have planted in your life against you. Any covenant or causes, any weapon fashioned against you or any member of your family, even the ones you do not know, stand on the word of God and begin to pull them down. That they will, be, they will never be effective in your life. They will never prosper in your life or that of your family or your faith or your work. Standing on the word of God, begin to overthrow the enemy any way he's trying to come and take charge of your life. Any way he may have taken control over you, begin to destroy and overthrow by the power you have as a Christian. It is wanting to approach, but I want you to begin to plant in your life those things that you're looking for, favors, blessings, in place of causes. People that will promote you rather than those that will pull you down. Now I want you to forget yourself. Pray for every other person under the influence of your word at this Bible study, apart from yourself now. Pray for every other person here that should there be anyone here who is being oppressed in any way by the agents of the evil one or by anything negative, that today we approach those powers we destroy their influence upon their upon the lives of every other person here apart from yourself in the name of Jesus Christ. Remember that as you're praying sincerely for everybody, everybody is praying for you. Begin to plant blessings in the life of everyone here at this Bible study in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, your word says Jesus appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Any way the devil may be oppressing anybody here, any way he may have gained control over anybody here, any way he's trying to frustrate anybody here, any way anybody may be trying to cripple anyone here, Anyway, sin may be trying to destroy anyone here. We pull down those negative influences in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. We pull down and destroy every weapon fashioned against us, your children, in the name of Jesus Christ. We pull down sickness in any form it may have taken in our lives, whether in our bodies, whether in our minds, or emotional sickness or spiritual sickness, in the name of Jesus Christ. We pull down every force that is trying to strangle us, whether spiritually or emotionally, in the name of Jesus Christ. We pull down anything at all that is making us, bringing frustration and making it impossible for us to attain the height God wants us to attain in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray that everything negative we move away from our life and that everything positive will come in in the name of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, like Jeremiah of old, we have the power to approach and pull down and we pull down anything negative in our lives, anything negative in our families, anything negative in our different situations. We destroy them and overthrow them and we begin to plant all the positive things we need to have in our lives, in our families and different situations in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you cover us 
with the blood of Jesus Christ. You cover our families with the blood of Jesus Christ. You cover our jobs and different interests with the blood of Jesus Christ. You cover our faith and our spiritual growth in the name of Jesus Christ. And that as we stand on your word and ask for your blessings, that those blessings will be abundant in our lives. Put testimonies into the lives of your children and grant that they praise you even more to Christ our Lord. Amen. We ask our mother Mary to intercede for us as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst men, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and over death. Amen. Surely, God, goodness and kindness shall flow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, pray for us. All you holy angels and saints of God, pray for Amen. us. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. With your almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe for more videos like this.